This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Hey friend, welcome to another episode of the ODAT Chat Podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. This is a podcast where my guests share their stories of alcoholism and addiction and their journey to recovery. So I actually have a very serious and important question for you. Have you worked the steps? Would you like to work the steps? What if I said you could work the steps with me on the show anonymously. I'm looking for a few brave souls who are willing to volunteer so that others may benefit from your example. So if you're interested, shoot me an email saying I'm in to podcastvolunteer at gmail.com. So I'm not going to do a bunch of long intros. I do want to say that I want to introduce you to my new friend, Jacob R. Jones. He's the author of Recovered how an unsustainable addiction led to a sustained life. So he talks about how he got addicted to opioids, um, how it affected his family, which is devastating, and how he, with the help of a lot of other people, was able to overcome his addiction and recover. In this episode, we dive deep into his very sports-centered family, including a dad who was a professional football player and his high school coach. And uh, we talk about how he struggled with some self-esteem issues, some self-consciousness and anxiety from being teased as a little kid to his subsequent opioid addiction, which led to some crazy psychotic break. It's always fascinating to me to hear the sequence of events that lead somebody out of that kind of bondage because it so often involves a near-death experience like Jacob's. But spoiler alert, he makes it out uh, of that deep despair, and now he uses those experiences to help others do the same. Of course, he goes on to describe this uh, in much more detail in the book and has many, many more stories and even some pictures, too. It's an awesome book. So listen, if you know me at all, you know I have a very special place in my heart for people who help others and their suffering like Jacob does. So With that, please enjoy this episode with Jacob R. Jones. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Again. Again. (laughs) Round two, but nobody will ever know about round one, so it's okay. Nobody will ever know that I forgot to hit record on the first interview, Yeah, which is super amazing. I'm so sad (laughs) that they didn't get to hear that one. I mean, I was... was feeling, feeling the magic, but, um, it, this will be equally as amazing. I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So what I typically do when we start off is talk about a little bit about your family background and stuff. And so maybe you can just share a little bit about where you grew up and what you were like as a little boy. Sure. Um, uh, well, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama. You got to say it that way too, huh? Birmingham, Alabama. (laughs) <laughs> so I grew up there and um, I was always a happy little boy, um, definitely smiling and um, always, uh, you know, want to run outside, go and play around and kind of normal, typical stuff growing up. Um, we were a sports family growing up. So my dad actually played college football at the University of Alabama and went on to play for the Falcons collegiately. And uh, I'm sorry, professionally, not collegiately. Mm-hmm. And then uh, played for the USFL. I don't know if you remember that back in the day. Right, so right. Was, USFL. That stands for United States Football League. You got it. Woohoo! So he played for the Birmingham Stallions for a couple of years. So anyways, long story short, we, uh, my mom actually played volleyball as well at the University of Alabama. Wow. Is that, where, that must be where they met. Yeah. So, um, yeah, growing up, uh, definitely a, a sports family, but I was way more interested in um, just, like I said, going and playing around outside. I always loved animals, loved anything that moved. So I would oftentimes come back with, with a snake or with a oh, God. My horse yeah, nightmare. <laughs> crickets or whatever, really, whatever moved. 
Um, I remember I came back one time with, uh, uh, with a little mouse or like a, a field mouse or a mole. I don't know exactly what it was. So I came back and named it. I forgot what I named it, but kept it in a little terrarium. I had like a terrarium pre-set up because my parents knew I was just coming home with stuff all the time. So like whatever. <laughs> just, and um, so I was, the snake and the mouse at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the longevity of the mouse. Yeah. Or, right. Or not, yeah. Uh, it'd be too long, but, um, but anyway, so I was, I remember just petting it and, uh, it bit me on the finger and I just flung it like that and it just smacked the wall. So it wasn't the mouse that got it, but it was me. So oh I always wanted goodness. to be a vet, but I think that was like an omen. Like, you know, I know you love animals, but you may not be the best suited to be a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that so, may not, that may not be a fair assessment for your poor little boy self. <laughs> no <know>. training. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, um, so anyway, so fast forward and, uh, I, I did actually get into sports. I got into sports a little bit later, um, around seventh grade Okay. and, um, started playing football and, uh, realized I was good at it. Um, and you know, back, I'll, I'll hop back just for one second. Uh, when I was younger, I remember being teased a lot for having big teeth mm. and big ears. I remember you and I were talking about that. I you know. got big teeth too. And they're beautiful now. <laughs> you do. They're amazing. They're beautiful tend, now. But We tend to grow into them, but yeah, exactly. I remember, uh, I'm hearing things like a uh, horse teeth. <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and same thing with me. So I remember, so I, I remember, um, with my little peanut head having these big old teeth and kids would make fun of me. And so I remember the first time um, having the thought I was always super happy as a child. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time when, um, when I intentionally would try not to smile as big because oh. I got made fun of for my teeth. And I remember um, looking back on my life, feeling that uh, feeling of rejection and right. uh, not being accepted by my peers and self-centered fear, self-consciousness. Exactly. Definitely. Terrible. Yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because it definitely plays a role um, later in my story. But yeah, for sure. Um, so anyways, in seventh grade, I started playing more sports and stuff like that and uh, ended up being good at it. As I said, my, my genetic pool that I drew from was was pretty good and had two parents that played, you know, <laughs> collegiate sports at Alabama. And um, so I ended up being pretty good. And, and what I found was um, because of my uh, athletic abilities that I was accepted by people. So the coaches were, um, very, uh, they would, uh, give me compliments all the time about how good mm -hmm. I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, I found that social circles at school would be a lot more accepting of me. Um, so it was something that I really took a liking to a, because I started out, I just really liked to play, but then B this, this also, uh, this thing started to kind of warp the reason why I liked it. Um, and I didn't see it then, of course, but looking back now, um, I see a part of the reason why I really was longing for this thing was kind of this sense of longing to be accepted mm -hmm. by others. And so that was a, a part of the driving reason why I was um, continuing to work so hard and doing so well. So you're receiving validation for performance, basically. Exactly. Yep. Validation, acceptance, and that was the thing that helped you overcome that sort of feeling of not belonging. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, everybody needs a community, right? So, and it's yeah. so painful when you're little to be ostracized. Little kids are cruel. They are. Yeah. Yeah. They are. Okay. So, so in, in junior high and high school is when you started to, um, um, be able to like attach to an identity as football player, like talented football player. That's what gave you confidence and, and self-esteem right. and overcame that isolation. Yeah. And it was at a time where I really needed something to soothe yeah. uh, that because I remember I, I moved from a private Christian school to a public school from seventh to eighth grade. And I remember my anxiety getting a lot higher and oh. having yeah, having a lot more uh, trouble in social situations. And um, it's funny because that's my perspective, but everybody around me would, and, and I've, when I've talked to people about this, even that knew me then, mm -hmm. they could never point that out. So they would never think that, but that's what I felt. Right. So on so, the outside, you had the mask that everything was fine, but on the inside, exactly. you're feeling, what, um, what was the, I don't know, it seems like for, you know, private school, what was the difference between private school and public school? 
it seems like private might be, they might be a little more sensitive and, you know, enforce the yeah. rules for like not bullying and, and stuff like that. Was, was public school yeah. a little rougher in that sense? Yeah, definitely. And just the whole, like, again, it was a private Christian school. So there was like no cussing and all that was oh, right. monitored and uh, very well, um, yeah. especially, for, you know, when I was younger. So when you're in, you know, first to seventh grade, obviously it's monitored a lot more. But as you grow older, even if it's a private Christian school or not, in junior high and high school, kids start to tend to do what they want to do. I know um, that's, that's when all, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. <laughs> so, Once the hormones start kicking in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I was, um, but I didn't experience any of that cause I was still pretty young at that point. So it was like <laughs> the kind of young sheltered age. And then you get catapulted into this, um, public uh, this public arena where it's like, you know, not, not the a values are, yeah, the values are different, right? Exactly. Did yeah, you know right. anybody at that public school when you went in or did you have to make all new friends? Yeah, I pretty much had to make all new friends. Oh, but you were um, connected to sports. So the first friends you made were, at least you had that, right? Yeah. So that, that made it a lot easier. Exactly. Got it. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what I was saying is that's where um, I started doing uh, sports and that's something that I love to do. Um, but also, um, uh, I feel like I kind of started to need that or I, looking back, I feel like I don't know what I would have done without it, mm. without sports. Like yeah. I would have been kind of lost and couldn't oh, have been lost. just okay with Jacob as just myself. Yeah. Um, did you have, but, did you, uh, do you have siblings? I do. Yeah. I have an older brother and a younger sister. Oh, that's right. Okay. Older. Br- and, um, did they switch schools with you as well? They did. So my brother's two years older than me. And, um, my little sister, um, is she's 24 right now. So she's, I think about seven years younger than I am. Okay. So you didn't go to school with her. No. Okay. So just you and your big brother at the scary new high school. (laughs) At the scary new high school. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, anyways, we went through there and, you know, to, to make, uh, throw a different dynamic in it. My dad was actually the head coach of the football team at mm-hmm. that school that we moved to and that was really the big driving force of why we changed oh, so okay. there was that dynamic as well trying to um make sure i was um acting accordingly but the funny thing is as soon as i got there um in eighth grade i remember again this is coming from trying to fit in with everybody else and i remember there's these kids um that were smoking behind the dugout at school um, smoking cigarettes we weren't smoking weed at that point uh-huh. uh, i don't think so anyways i wasn't that bad. <laughs> And, um, so we went there and I remember, uh, getting caught for doing that and having, getting suspended. <gasps> it was like my first year there. And my, oh my dad, God, your dad must've been so mad. He was livid because, you know, the first year your kids come to the school and what happens? He gets suspended. He may, he's uh, ma- you're making him look bad. <laughs> you're making him look terrible. I know. Letting everybody <laughs> down. So Shame. Uh, I uh, know exactly. So, anyways, all this stuff, just painting all this picture for mm-hmm. um, leading up to what we're eventually going to get into. But do that, and then, anyways, come back and um, uh, I continue on with the football thing, and uh, end up um, having a few different schools offer me and choose to go to the University of Alabama. So that's where um, when I went there again, this thing was amplified to where. Again, I love to play the sport, but mm-hmm. also love the validation that I receive sure. due to my performance. Yeah. So I kind of latched on like I did in junior high and high school, but to uh, an, even, an even more uh, heightened degree to this. Um, I'm not Jacob Jones. I am this University of Alabama football player because that's way more exciting and interesting and uh, has a lot more confidence than just this person that – has anxiety and panic attacks and has trouble wow. sleeping. Well, how, how old were you when you started with the anxiety attacks or um, anxiety? Um, so the anxiety started um, probably in eighth grade. Oh, you know, so young. Yeah. And that transition. And um, I remember oh, yeah. uh, actually talking to my mom about it in eighth grade and having that conversation. And uh I don't know. Panic attacks probably, I think that was more so like of a college thing. So those started probably in college. 
Okay. Now, let me just, I'm just curious, um, with the anxiety, you know, we know a lot more now about, you know, anxiety and things like that. Did they, were they aware or provide any treatment or counseling to address the anxiety? Um, I think we did some of that in high school and went to a couple places. I don't think I was ever really willing to see all of it through or just, I I don't know. You know, when you start out, it's like when you start out on recovery, you just don't know what you don't know. And you're like, Oh, well, this will work. And you think it's just like a one shot thing. Like, Oh, I'll just exercise more and I I won't go back and use drugs or alcohol anymore. So it's like that type of approach where it's Mm -hmm. like a um, very naive way of approaching a situation that you don't know could be so detrimental down the line. Yeah. And I mean, uh, yeah. And as a kid, you certainly, wouldn't be able to self-diagnose, you know, but it's, it seems like there's a lot more awareness now with, from, from the adults as parents, you know, when you're parenting a child, you know, to, to look for signs and things like that. But it's so interesting that even, you know, as young as you are back in the eighth grade, um, you know, there wasn't sort of that awareness or um, ability to identify, you know, what was going on to give you treatment. Cause I, I mean, don't you ever wonder like, Oh, what if we had addressed the anxiety you know, when you were yeah. young, like maybe, you know, you wouldn't have gone down that path or where that you eventually went to. But Yeah, it's interesting to think about that. But, yeah. But yeah. so they didn't really recognize it and you tried to manage it in other ways. And then. Exactly. I actually yeah. remember the, the first time I used something in an in a addictive way was when I took a Unisom. So I had Unisom because I was having trouble sleeping through that, you know, kind of eight through high school phase. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, so I actually, I remember taking it at night and thinking, wow, this kind of helps calm me down and kind of helps me sleep. And I remember taking it like at 5 p.m. one day because I had anxiety. Mm. So, and this was like a precursor. Didn't see it then, obviously see it now, but right. this is a precursor to me trying, uh, grasping at things to try to topically soothe my anxiety or my or yeah. And my sleeplessness and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. was the first time I can track back and, and see that I took something that was not for its intended use, but mm-hmm. took it on my own will to try to do something to take it in my own hands and fix myself. Got it. Yeah. The precursor, a little foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Hopefully okay, it's so not a spoiler. Get- Oh, yeah, a little spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. So um, you make it to college and you're all excited to start your collegiate football career. And then mm-hmm. what happens? So I get there and I see your face, but nobody I know. else can see it. It's a podcast. People can't happens. see my face. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's coming. You know what happens. Yeah. So, um, anyways, I get there to college and um, pretty much right off the bat, I uh, ended up tearing my quad. I actually tore it one time in high school. Oh. And um, ended up rehabbing it uh, in a different light of using the word rehab, but for right, I know. quads. Wait, and, normal uh, people use rehab. <laughs> right, I guess normal or abnormal. I don't know which way. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but um, so I tore it one time in high school. Then I go and uh, tore it basically right off the bat. So I took a red shirt my first year oh. um, because of that and. Uh, Anyways, uh, kept trying to come back. I'll come back for a month or two, tear it again, oh my come God. back for a month or two, and then it would go back and forth to each leg. And when I was all said and done, it was like after a two-year span, I'd torn it six different times. It oh could never God. stay healthy. Did you ever get to play? No. So I never got a chance to <sighs> actually play on the field. Um, you know, I would obviously dress out for games and all that stuff. But I never got the chance to actually um, go out there and perform. So that was kind of... That must of, have been so heartbreaking. Yeah, it it was. It was something that took me a while to get over. Because mm-hmm. that was all, again, that was my identity for the longest right. time. Or yeah. what I was looking forward to is, is being this this thing that I built up in my mind. And, um, <coughs> you know, from uh, seventh grade through high school, um, and even as a younger kid kind of looking at that and wanting that, but definitely um, having aspirations of doing that and the dedication and the hard work put in from seventh grade oh till 12th grade. And then it just gets taken away. And it's like, that's not what you're doing. And I had, I mean, it was all the pride and all the ego. And like yeah. I said, everything 
um, that was wrapped up into there, it just got ripped out. And so I had a lot of trouble dealing with it. Now, let me ask you, cause I know you spent some time in, you know, a private Christian school and you must have developed a relationship with God, you know, um, did that period of time in college make you question God at all? You know, it's like, why is this happening to me? You know, did it, did it, did it make you, did it make you question your faith in God at all? Um, no, I don't think it ever did, but not, not really that. I don't think it's really saying a whole lot because at that time, it's not like my faith was super strong. I was in the college type thing and I would go to church every now and then. And, Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have a relationship with God. I did the kind of like religious side of things, you know, went Mm -hmm. to church every now and then and did my, my duty there. Um, but never took it further than that, you know? So I don't, I don't think that it, that I ever thought about that too much, um, but it may have been because my relationship with God wasn't super strong. I was just kind of doing it out of religious duty. Right. I, I think that's, you know, I grew up in the church too, and I think a lot of my religious training was out of obligation. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I totally get that, but it's, it was interesting that you handled that. How, so how did you handle all of the frustration that you were, that's a two year period of, injuries and rehabs that must have been so frustrating how did you handle all that did you start drinking or using them yeah I actually did so I remember I got um, I got pneumonia actually my freshman year and this is the first time that I remember taking an actual drug um, and loving it so I took um, they gave me cough syrup for my pneumonia Mm -hmm. uh, that had um, hydrocodone in it which is like a a typical thing that they'll give you for um, any type of pain. They used to prescribe it left and right for pretty much everything. But it's um, so crazy to me because when I was when I was coming up, I mean, I I hear of cough syrup with like codeine in it, right? But so is hydrocodone sort of like a um, stronger version of codeine? It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems a little excessive. Yeah, and I think it's just doctors got started doing that without seeing the dangers or. I don't know. I actually, I, I'm not going to speak for doctors on, on why they prescribe that, but, um, I, cause I think it's very necessary. Um, especially like I had pneumonia. So I think it was like a two week thing and, um, it was, uh, started to get pretty painful to cough and, sure, all that stuff yeah. and couldn't okay. sleep. But on top of that, what I found was, so on the label, it said, take one to two teaspoons or whatever the prescription dosage was. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Took one to two teaspoons. I think I took two because I was like, you know. Yeah, of course, uh, two. Yeah, t- taking the max that I could. So I took two and like 30 minutes later, I was like, wow, like I feel a lot better. And it's not only my pneumonia, it was my anxiety. I felt relaxed. I felt like wow. I could go talk to people. And then I was like, that's awesome. So I just immediately, like without thinking, took the bottle and drank half of it. And then I remember oh feeling like, Oh man, my stomach hurts so bad. I'm never doing that again. And then like, once I got past my stomach hurting at like minute 20, mm-hmm. like minute 45, I just felt this rush of euphoria and oh. just like this bliss where I thought that nothing else mattered. Again, my anxiety was completely gone. I could go out and talk to people, even though I was sick, I could go out and talk to people and be social mm. I wasn't worried about those feelings of not being accepted or or not saying something stupid and looking crazy in front of my friends. Um, All those feelings of insecurity were gone when I took that. Isn't that amazing? I feel like the insecurity is like the root of all evil. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) To be relieved of it, that must have been amazing. It was. So that's that's what it was. I felt like, talk about like a spiritual experience, that's what I had. Yeah. I was like, this is the stuff that God has put on this earth for Jacob to take because Jacob can <laughs> cope with real life. That's, that's what he made it for. That's what exactly you know. a spiritual and, experience. Uh, I totally get that. It was, it yeah. was. Yeah. And um, as somebody that has been struggling and longing, looking for relief to find it in that form uh, that. turned out to be um, not the best thing. <sighs> yeah. Because there's a price tag to be paid. Right. There is not, not at that time, but yeah. eventually that, eventually. Um, that check you write, that has to be cash at some point or those debts that you pile up from doing that yeah. over and over again, you eventually have to go and pay them somehow. So, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, 
I want to, I, I know there's like a sequence of events that lead you to hospitalization, um, right. but there must have been, you know, there's, there's a reason that people get addicted to drugs and alcohol, right? It's because it's fun, right? That's yeah. what I tell my kids. I'm like, you know what? There's people do it's drugs awesome, it's fun. <laughs> it's super fun. Great, great parenting, Arlena. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, in, in some of those crazy experiences, there's typically like, you know, fun things that happen. Right. So, I mean, I don't want to promote drugs and alcohol, but what were the, what were the things that were happening that were making you feel like this was a good idea? Other, you know, did you have like some really fun times where you were just like, Oh my God, this is amazing. I'm going to do this forever. Yeah. Um, really. And that's what I tell me. And that's what I jokingly say when I, what I said to you, but it, when I tell people that and they kind of look at me like I'm crazy, but I'm like, nobody, uh, nobody's going to tell you that taking a drink or a drug to soothe your pain right then and there is going to, is not going to make it feel better because it does. Yeah. I would be lying to you if I told you that, um, that doing drugs or drinking, um, didn't take away my, my anxiety or make my life better because it did. Yeah. But it's the, uh, what happens after that and the, the downfield perspective that you gain from screwing up over and over and right. over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, really the biggest thing, um, was kind of having that freedom, uh, again, from, from the, the thoughts and the feelings I was experiencing from who I thought I was at that time having freedom from that person to be this new confident person that can go out and um, talk to girls or go out to the bars and enjoy myself and not be again, not, uh, not feel that insecurity and stuff like that. So that was, yeah. and there was other fun times and kind of wild times in college, which we don't do too much promotion of the uh, drug life. Fine. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just you try. You try. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, okay. So, well, you know, and, and listen, at some point it becomes um, a problem, right? Uh, when did you, when did you know that things had to change or when did you know that this was becoming a problem? So I remember about 20, um, so again, I, I figured out that um, that opiates, they just did something for me that nothing else in this world had ever done for me. Sure. Um, and I remember, so after I took my medical release, I started to see, and I, and I had been using uh, drugs and smoking weed intermittently, but not a lot be, uh, because of football. Bit. Yeah. Yeah, and drinking. Yep, definitely. So I actually remember... Um, one time my, uh, my roommate and I split a, um, a handle of aristocrat gin the night Oof. before a game. And I remember going to the game and just like dreading warmups, like, Oh my God, this is going to be terrible to go out there and run because it was like the worst type of alcohol, you know, just like the, the cheapest stuff that you can get your hands on. And we split like a handle of it. It was bad. So really like anything. Yeah. I didn't really discriminate. I just had one that I'm sure everybody has their one or two things that they love, but, um, to go have fun or party like you were talking about, or just go and, and take a load off. I would always push it to the extreme. Um, no matter what substance I had. Right. Where well, you were always that guy that everyone, the, the last guy standing at the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I remember, um, actually, so with, uh, some of my wide receiver core at the time, I won't name any names, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Protect the innocent. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> or not so innocent. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we're all really good friends and a lot of them smoked weed. And um, so we would be in there uh, in one of our rooms, just pass around a blunt and uh, they'd all be like tapped out and like me and there's like this one other guy that would keep going and they would always comment and be like, I don't know how you're still smoking weed right now. Like they're all like almost in a comatose from all this. <laughs> And I'm sitting here and just like loving it, like continuing yeah. to do it. Like there, there is no, no and it's model, that, huh? no, it's that thing when, uh, when the addiction just clicks in, it's, there's, you intend to just like, Oh, just have one puff. And then one puff turns into like, you know, seven blunts and then you want more. Yeah. It's not funny that there's always like that, uh, common thread of more. It's like a disease of more. Yeah. It's like once it I is. find something that I like, it's just like, so gluttonous like more that's all I want is more and that it's funny that you say that because that 
that mindset saturated not only my drug use, but my life. And I remember mm-hmm. going into the University of Alabama, of course, childhood dream. This is something I worked so hard for. And sure. before I even got there, I remember thinking, well, when I get to the NFL, I remember right. having dreams and aspirations. And I hadn't even stepped foot on campus yet. Yeah. And I was already bypassing this thing that I worked so hard for, yeah. that I trained so hard for, that I'd built up in my mind. I was already not even there, I was already on the next step mentally. Yeah, that's such a common theme too. It's like just nothing is ever enough, always looking for the next thing. But really that says to me, it's like never being present, like never really appreciating or being in gratitude for what is, right? I agree. Always in the future. Yeah, that's pretty, you're hitting all, you're checking all the boxes. (laughs) Yeah, did you diagnose me yet? Yeah. You're Act, sick. Alcohol. That's all I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, through a series of events, so let's, um, so what was the darkest part that made you really feel like, like, did you have a bottom like they talk about in the 12 step rooms? I think I had a couple of them. Mm-hmm. Um, probably enough to, um, so you were skipping bottom. <laughs> Yeah, I was like exactly. along the bottom. Yeah, yeah, just banging my head along the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Yep. and uh, couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, but there's a few times um, some bad things happen. Um, you know, I eventually, you know, my drug use started taking off. I got arrested um, oh. and went to a drug court um, and uh, had to do a year of drug court. And the whole time, uh, it never even dawned on me that. Uh, what got me in there uh, was the thing that I was continuing to try to figure out how to do the whole time during drug court. So I'd find out creative ways to use whatever I could get my hands on because I just couldn't stand being sober. I hated sure. being sober. Can, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't, I don't know what drug court is. You don't know what drug court is? You're such know. an angel. I, n- I never, I never went to drug court. <laughs> I had a boyfriend that was a policeman, so I never got arrested or anything. Oh yeah. yeah. He got you out? A couple times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a sweetheart. What's tr- I know. So you, you get arrested. Were you with other friends or what did you, what were the, what did they arrest you for? Like possession or something? Yeah. Possession. Mm-hmm. Possession. Okay. And, and you had to go to drug court. So that's like, that's, but you said drug court for a year, but what does that mean? So basically that means, um, you have to go and appear before a judge every week, every week, every week. And oh, then man. you have, a color code that you have to call in every morning. And if they call your color, you have to go take a drug test. Oh, random drug testing. Okay. So weekly visits and random. Dr- that sounds horrible. Yeah. For um, a drug addict, it's basically, that's the worst nightmare you can ever think of. Because so that accelerated your consequences. Yeah, it did. And so this, and it was bad because I was having to leave my job at the time and make up excuses because I'd have to go three or four times a week and it was an hour and a half round trip to where I would go. Yeah. And that's just driving. That doesn't even mean doing the drug tests and all that stuff. So it's probably when it was all said and done two hours. And sometimes I call and I'd be at work and be like, Oh crap, they called my color and I have to figure out a way to go there before five o'clock or whenever the last time that you'd go take a drug test was. And uh, having to do that, I mean, that's like, that was a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry and like, oh my, oh my God, if I miss and can't get out there or if there's traffic and I, and I miss a drug test, like you go to jail, like they don't take, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it. Like if you go back, didn't do your drug test and appear that next week, you go to jail. Okay. I have a couple of questions. So what is the, dr- is, are they taking blood or is it like a urine sample or? It's a urine screen. Oh my gosh. So is that, does that mean like somebody is watching you? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, humiliating. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. And were you clean? You tested clean all that time? Yeah. Except for one time when, so I had a prescription to benzos, benzodiazepines, which are, it's like in the family of Xanax and Klonopin and Valium. Okay. For anxiety. For anxiety. Right. So I talked to them into can, let me continue to take that while I was on drug court okay. because I had a prescription for it. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so long story short, uh, I went to one of my dad's game. My dad was coaching, uh, at a college at this time and, um, <clears throat> went to one of his games, met somebody there and they had Valium, which is, and I had Klonopin as my prescription, but they're mm-hmm. both benzos. 
So I figure, oh, well, I can take as many of those as I want because when I get back, they'll test it and I'll pop positive for a benzo and a prescription for my benzos. Uh-huh. Um, I didn't know that they had the capabilities of randomly. Yeah, so they would randomly oh, send tests off yeah. to, to see um, exactly, test the metabolite to see exactly what drug it is. Oh my so I remember goodness. going in and she was like, well, Jacob, do you have anything to tell me? And this was like uncharacteristic. This didn't usually happen. You're all, I, was uh-oh. Like, I was like, no, I mean, uh, you know, I have my prescription to benzos and I was taking benzos, you know, trying to like. Right, right. Did you know? It. Did you know you were busted? Kind of. I was kind of fighting it in my mind, but I did. So um, anyways, when you go in to see the, the judge, if you lie, they basically lock you up for longer. Um, so if you come clean, it was just, I think the weekend that I had to stay in there, uh, in jail. And, um, so I came clean I told him, I was like, yeah, I took this and this. Cause I knew I was busted. And I knew somehow they, because of the, the yeah. way they were leading the questions that they knew. So I had to spend that weekend in jail. Um, oh, bummer. yeah, but the long story short at the end of the year, um, uh, I ended up graduating and crazy enough. And, my mom thinks this is, this is like conspiracy theory, but my very last <laughs> drug test, I was, I tested positive for opiates and they know that I got arrested for opiates and I didn't take opiates. You didn't? Um, no. And, and you they, tested positive? I did, but they sent it off to be uh, tested at a, a, you know, at a more, um, I don't know, like a higher scale or more, um, I don't have the right words for what I'm trying to say right uh, now. Like more, more examined, testing. yeah, more focused. Yeah, more exam, more sophisticated testing. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, then the just basic test. So mm-hmm. they sent it off and figured out that I was that I tested positive for just something random. It wasn't opiates, but it looked like opiates from that test. Oh, okay. And I really didn't take any. That was my last mm-hmm. drug test. I'm not going to take something before I was, you know, scot free. Um, so anyways, I go and I graduate and this whole time, it never even dawned on me like Jacob, well, maybe you should just not use, you know, drugs or drink anymore. Cause it got you into the situation. Yeah. I, that thought never even crossed my mind. What Isn't I was doing the whole wild? time. It is. It's bizarre. And, uh, that's the insanity of the whole it's thing. The insanity, it's just total self-denial. It is. Yeah. And so I was just stockpiling the whole time. And oh just waiting for the day that uh, I was going and seeing doctors. I was finding good deals from my buddies that had, you know, this and that. And so I started uh, as soon as I graduated. I mean, I think I waited like a day or two because I was like, oh, my God, I don't know. If they like call me back randomly like <laughs> the next day. So I think I waited like a day or two, even though I graduated. But very shortly after, I just started uh, diving back into it head first. And oh, man was worse off than ever. So it got to a point where, um, again, this is, um, uh, kind of, I don't know, this is probably like 2014. So, you know, I've been using for, gosh, this is probably, you know, at least six, seven years at this point, you know, on and off, Mm -hmm. had a lot of consequences, got arrested, this and that. Lived my brother, ended up, you know, I was doing typical stuff that we do, you know, just being crazy, trying not to pay rent, Mm -hmm. getting in fights with my brother, just not being a good person, being completely selfish. Um, And, uh, man, I've been really talking myself up lately. I'm just painting the best (laughs) picture. (laughs) You sound horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. But it's honest. I mean, that's that's the person that I was. That's that's the thing. There's a reason drugs are illegal. It makes us horrible. Yeah, exactly. I get it. Yeah, it just brings out right. all the worst parts of me. You're not there now. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. I hope <laughs> I'm a little bit better now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I'm going, you know, again, having fights with my brother, just being selfish and all this stuff. And, and so I ended up saying, uh, oh, you just, you know, you don't understand me and you're being tough on me, making me pay rent at your house. And, <laughs> how dare you? you know, yeah, making me pay for this thing that I broke at your house. How dare you? Unreasonable. Right. And, um, so I ended up moving in with my parents and, but this gets to the point where I was, I was literally sick and tired of using, I was done trying to find it. I was done going through withdrawals. Um, I was just done with the consequences. I was done with everything. I was just tired. I don't know if you've been to that point and you're sick using and tired, a sick and tired. 
oh my goodness and oh, i was just done so yeah. i gave all of my uh all of my drugs and everything to my mom and i was like mom i'm done this is it and i was taking at that time i had prescriptions this is just prescriptions i was taking a lot of other stuff but mm-hmm. i had prescriptions to uh lortab i had a prescription to like xanax and I had a prescription to um what is it uh, ambien sleeping medication Ambien, yeah ambien's very popular i hear yeah and I was, I remember I would take my whole 30 day prescription of Ambien in one night. Yikes. Why? <laughs> Just to try to get high. I mean, I was, I was at that point in my using career where yeah. I was, you know, and I was Oxycontin, Xanax, whatever. Oh my gosh. I my hands on all the combination of it. And I didn't know people intentionally did that to try to commit suicide. I right. didn't know that. Oh, people, yeah, the, yeah. Because they were just done and. And I wasn't intentionally trying to, but I think at that point in my life, if I didn't wake up, I was kind of okay with that. You know? Oh, so sad. Yeah. And um, I just didn't have anything to live for. And life was torturous. It sucked. I didn't have any real friends. I, I, I couldn't be a real friend to any, anybody. I was constantly letting my family down. I felt like I was just a, you know, a negative black hole to the people that loved me. Right. And, um, so anyways, I I gave my parents all of my, everything that I had. And, um, I started just going for lack of a better term, crazy. I mean, I was just like, I didn't sleep for a week. So that probably had a lot to do with it. Sure. And, um, then they took me to the hospital and they actually admitted me to, uh, the CCU, which is the critical coronary unit because my resting heart rate was at stroke level. And they were scared I was going to have a stroke. Mm-hmm. And um, I was in the and hospital. And this is from the detox? This yeah. This is from like the sudden. Self detox. The, yeah. So the abrupt um, stoppage of the drugs created right. this condition that nearly killed yeah. you. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it was so to anybody listening, if you're taking massive amounts of benzos, <laughs> be careful seek medical attention medical you needed so you would have needed medical detox is what you really needed yes definitely and uh for opiates you know it's it it just sucks it hurts really bad um you don't sleep and stuff like that Mm -hmm. but um but there's a different with like the ambien uh, you know added to it and the um, benzos added to it there's a completely different psychological component that goes on and it's actually, it can be fatal because you can have seizures and die when oh you God. come off of uh, benzos. And um, so I was in the hospital and I don't even remember being in there. Um, it was just literally like, like you remember a dream state. It was remembering it all like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, I remember just being completely out of it. You know, the piecing together like my fragmented memories with the stories that my families were telling me and um, they would put the IVs in me and I was just ripping the IVs out as soon as they put them in. So I was ripping out the wrong way, you know, like a, yeah, terrible. Brutal. And, um, and so I was so weak uh, from not sleeping that whole week before and that whole week there. Um, They said I was sleeping maybe like 30 minutes in a 24 hour time period. And, um, my parents, uh, or I remember my mom and my grandmother would have to help me to the bathroom to use the bathroom and then help me back to the bed. Cause that's like all I could do. I was just so weak. And, um, so they thought, uh, one day that they would go and try to walk me down the hallway. And, um, because, you know, I, I think they were kind of scared that like, okay, he's like not moving. And if he develops blood clots in his legs or something mm-hmm. like that, then it could be bad. And, um, so they try to go and walk me down the hallway. And again, you know, I was like, I had to have assistance going to the restroom. And it was my grandmother on one side and my mom on the other side. And they get me in the hallway and I don't know, something just happened. And I just took off and I just started like scorching down the hallway. <laughs> and I, I, I found, I found, I didn't come up the stairs and know where the stairs were located, but I went directly to the stairs and went all the way down and went out of the hospital. I didn't know where gown and everything. No, I was actually just in my boxers. So, you know, <laughs> envision that beautiful sight. I tail it out your underwear on the street. Right. And my hair was like, uh, you know, my hair is super curly when it grows out, but I had like, you know, when, 
when I'm sitting in the hospital bed, it's like a fro basically. So you can just envision me with my fro just like screaming down the hallway and going yeah, down fro. the stairs. Awesome. Yeah. And I don't know, I guess, you know, like we talked about my, uh, I had a history of being very athletic. So I guess that like muscle memory <laughs> kicked in. The funny thing was my mom was the first person that caught up to me. It's security guards, all of them just like. She's an athlete too. That's where you got oh, yeah, from. Athletes. So just like dusted them. And, uh, my grandmother said the security guard came up to her after and it's like, Hey, you know, if you need a job, just let me know because we'll sign <laughs> you up right away. <laughs> Cause she was the one that caught me. And, that is uh, wild. But I busted out. I remember busting out and just having the feeling. I don't remember, again, like anything visually, really, but just having that feeling of being just like, what? Like, I thought this was going to be something different. And my mom said it was like 35 degrees outside and it was oh pitch black. Goodness. And I feel like if it was a sunny day, that I would have been like Forrest Gump and like just kept running. <laughs> <Forrest Yeah. laughs> and uh, like, who knows? I'll probably, yeah. I don't know. It probably would have been bad because I probably would have ran into the street or something like that. So that, Oh, you were so lucky it didn't end badly. I know. How so long were you times. in the hospital for? Um, I was there for a week. And actually, after that, I spent three weeks in a psych ward. Oh, that must have been so scary. I keep hearing all these crazy stories about psych wards and how truly crazy some of those people are. Um, and you know, what was interesting, um, about our first conversation that was magical that nobody's going to get to hear, um, uh -huh. is that, um, we, we kind of touched on sort of the dysfunction of, you know, uh, mental health management. Right. right? And, um, and so it almost seems like it makes you, in my mind, if we are so focused on the problem, like whatever you focus your attention on expands, right? So it seems like it's unhealthy in a way to just be so focused on the sickness and the problem. And then you have all these people validating how sick you are and here, take wow. a whole bunch of drugs and stuff. And oh um, so tell me about your experience with that. It was not good. Um, I'll, I'll touch on my experience and I'll go from there. But um, when I actually came to and actually had lucid thoughts um, was probably about a week into there. So it was probably two weeks into this whole debacle between the week in the CCU and a week in the psych ward. Then I remember coming to and I just the first thing I remember is seeing people that had their throats slit and had like staples or stitches and had their wrists slit. And I literally woke up. I was like, I'm in hell. Like this is, this is what hell would be like, you know? And, um, and so I, I remember them just like giving me all this medication and I just felt terrible and like a, a walking zombie. And, um, if I didn't have an advocate, like didn't have my mother or my father or family, like looking after me and asking the doctors, like, what are you prescribing him? You're prescribing him too much why are you doing this? And I was having like complications because of these, I mean, they were bringing out like the heavy duty, uh, probably, I don't know if it was rightfully so, but like I was mm -hmm. definitely not in a good mental state at that point. Um, Thank God you had a good advocate. Yes. Because, and I feel for people who don't have advocates in those mm -hmm. situations because yeah. you'd be done like bad. So I'll back up in, in the hospital. Like they thought that, the doctor said, if he's like, if he lives, like they thought that there's a solid wow. chance that I would not make it through that. Like if he lives, you'll probably have to take care of him for the rest of his life. Like they didn't think that I was going to come out of this psychosis or this mental state that I was in. Hmm. Um, they just thought that my brain was like broken. And that was, that and they're was diagnosing good. this without even giving you enough time to try to even heal. Yeah. And my mom is sitting there pleading with him. Like, we touched on in the beginning, showing him pictures of who I was when I was little. Like he's never had mental issues. You know, he's had anxiety and stuff like that, but he's never been psychotic. He's never been all this. He's a happy boy. And this just happened. And this is not, this is not my, this is not my boy. This is not yeah. Jacob. And I was trying to show him that, um, but yeah. they didn't seem to really care that much. Yeah. They're looking for, I don't know, they're looking for the problem. And I think they're so accustomed to families pleading that maybe they're insensitive. I don't, yeah. know. I don't mean to speak for the medical professionals and, and God bless them for being there for those that really oh need God. it. Yeah. But um, I really feel like there's a dis, and this is just my personal opinion. I'll get off my soapbox in a second, but it just seems like the medical community needs to be educated about addiction. 
Like this is an addiction, oh, yeah. an addiction psychotic break, not somebody who has a history of mental illness. It seems like it's, and, and they don't seem to differentiate and they diagnose and treat the same way. You know right. what I mean? I think okay, they so, have uh, so many boxes that they, uh, that they can put people in. And mm-hmm. if you have, um, similar types of symptoms that this box requires and they put you in that box and you're whatever that box is called. Yeah. Um, and I think there are, there are doctors out there that um, are uh, methodical and actually listen and look at patient history and take time. But, and I'm not, I'm not knocking doctors. I'm really not. Um, I think that, you know, they have a very important calling and uh, for sure because you're dealing with people's lives. Yeah. Um, but it comes from a good place. Yeah, but but I mean, I get it um, from the aspect of, um, uh, you know, they see so many people and uh, just to say, okay, you're this, okay, you're this and just prescribe you medicine, da, 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 da. But it's like at some point you got to wake up like this is people's lives. Yeah. And, and there are doctors out there definitely, you know, plenty of them that do it right and they really do yeah. their best and they look at it. But there's some I think that really just don't. I think their heart has been hardened for one reason or another, and sure. they kind of just uh, get desensitized to seeing it. And, you know, uh, it's the same thing. They just have a higher calling. It's like a, being a policeman or something mm-hmm. in a political office. You just mm-hmm. have a higher calling and you're dealing with people's lives and um, there should be a higher accountability for that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's get to, I think you end up in rehab. So how do, how do you go from, from this to like a 12 step rehab. So from there, again, we've kind of expedited this, um, but I, I, you know, had consequence out of consequence. Again, like you said, skipping along the bottom, (laughs) banging my head. And um, so I ended up from there, you would think that I would learn my lesson that would scare the life. But no. And it did for a couple of months. A couple of months. Okay. So I did great for a few months. Then I took a job uh, as a restaurant manager. So, mm-hmm. which everybody knows, it's not that it's stressful fun. and not, doesn't have a whole lot of drugs in that scene. So, that's sarcasm. If you sarcasm, can't see my face. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, very stressful work environment um, and all that stuff. And I'm not pinning it on that. Uh, I'm not saying that's why I was using. I was already sure. no, yeah, no, I get predisposed it. to all that. But I'm saying it didn't help. Right. Um, so I go back long story short and started using again and consequences continue to get worse and worse and worse. And I finally hit that point again where I was just done. Like I was really, really done. And this time I had the experience to go with that desperation, that feeling of like I'm done and I was willing to do work um, and put that feeling into some sort of action. And I didn't know where because I felt like I had tried everything. And so I checked into a rehab uh, in Florida and um they uh had us work on some of the steps you know in the 12 step programs like the like they do um mm-hmm. and uh so i remember doing my first step um which is just like an admission of uh powerlessness and mm-hmm. um so what i did was or what they had everybody do was write down um different scenarios where they were powerless and basically pull all the tough scenarios to show like um, for instance, you know, just, this is just an example. Uh, like I was, um, like if somebody brought up a story about their grandfather dying and them going into the, into their room to steal their pain medication, like mm-hmm. that's an example of powerlessness. So stuff that like really is painful and really tough to bring up. Mm-hmm. I remember having like a panic attack before, <laughs> before I presented because it's like everything that I tried so hard to suppress and keep down and not tell anybody about it's like I just unzipped it and just let it all out and I remember being exhausted after doing that but also the next day or two feeling this new thing of this very clean sense of like uh, feeling a little bit lighter um, and a little bit better and a little more confident sharing the secret uh, yeah and uh, it was definitely through action you know Um, So we continued there and um, ended up working through step four, um, which is just making an inventory and yeah, doing a little bit of the step five and sharing the resentment portion about it there. And I actually worked through step nine all the way to making amends uh, with my sponsor uh, while simultaneously working steps with my uh, rehabilitation. 
rehabilitation facility. That oh, was. that's interesting. So, um, it was, so was this an outpatient program or? No, it was inpatient. Yeah. Okay. So you were like in rehab for 30 days. So they, how did you find us? What? 90 days. Yeah. That's brilliant. Listen, the longer, the better, to be honest. I mean, I uh, know there's something magical about that 90. I don't know what it is. Can't put my finger on it. Yeah. But it's enough time for like the fog to clear and then yeah. enough like spiritual pounding that you like <laughs> start to start to see things a little bit clearer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, like open up to the idea that you can enjoy life. That's, you know, a life of sobriety. Cause yes. I'm, I had no category or no shelf in my brain to, to see what that looked like. So. No, I know. Like, I mean, we, we show up and we're totally lost and confused and we have to start over like what makes sense. Okay. So 90 days. So you're doing work with a counselor, but you also mentioned having, a, how did you find a sponsor? They were taking you outside, to outside yeah. meetings, to outside meetings. Yeah. I actually found my, I found my sponsor because I asked um, somebody, the person that referred me to go to that place. Uh -huh. I said, well, do you know anybody in Gainesville? And this person texted me three names and mm -hmm. I just called the first one. So it was definitely a God thing. Wow. Willingness. Look at you. Completely willing at that stage. And I was just very, I was How willing to go to. Him? Sorry. Uh, to no, that's okay. Um, How did you ask him to be your sponsor? Um, I think I just got his number and called him. I was like, Hey, um, I'm in rehab. Will you sponsor me? <laughs> you know, it's, it's along those lines. that's very direct. <laughs> right. Like, Hey, I need your help. Uh, sponsor me, please. And he just and he said, like, yes. Hey. Okay. Yeah. And he, uh, he, he gave me the rundown of like, Hey, are you willing to do a step four? Are you willing to take inventory? I was like, yeah, I've kind of already done some of that in in a rehab. So I kind of am familiar with that process. And, um, Actually, at this point, I'm sorry, this is before I'd done that. So I got him kind of probably the first month I was there. Mm -hmm. um, but he asked me those questions. Are you willing to do an inventory and share with me? And I said, yes. Um, then, you know, he said, are you willing to actually go and make amends to people that you've harmed? And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And um, then he said, okay, when we're done with these steps, um, you get to step 12. Are you willing to carry the message and go um, sponsor other people or go do whatever you need to do? Um, to carry the message. And I was like, yep, I am. So mm -hmm. he hit all the big action steps. Obviously there's more steps in there, Sure. Um, but he hit all the big action steps that people usually balk at, right? Yeah. The ones where you have to actually go home and actually dig deep and actually write an inventory yeah. where you have to actually go and call somebody and go show up at their house. And it's, it can be embarrassing or can be very fear ridden. Um, he hit those steps and was like, are you willing to do that stuff? And I was like, I want to do anything because oh, so what I've been doing be is, yeah, I was that gift of desperation is, um, you gotta have it. I don't think you can replace it with anything. Well, I'm glad you got that. Cause, um, you know, it's scary to do those things like the inventory. I was, I was at a meeting this morning and this lady, she had relapsed and was facing her four step and she was so scared. And I thought, Oh man, just, you know, but I was, you know, my experience, it sounds like you have the same experience. I was so afraid to get loaded. I was, I was more afraid of getting loaded than I was of doing the four set. Was that, did you have a similar experience? Um, yeah, definitely. So there's, um, what was it like the fear of doing work or the fear of reaching out, um, eclipse, um, the pain of where I was. So when basically when uh, the, the pain of where I was got so great that the fear of doing those things became eclipsed by that. So I was willing to do it yeah. because before, you know, the, the pain that I was in wasn't exactly, you know, it just wasn't bad enough or, or I'd experience it and it would eclipse that, that circle for a moment in time, then it would kind of shrink back a little bit and everything would kind of be a little bit better and um, so I wouldn't really reach out for help. I wasn't really willing to do that four step. But I got to the point where I did it so many times that that circle was that pain and that shame and mm -hmm. guilt that I was carrying around was infinitely worse yeah. um, than the fear of reaching out. Yeah. What was your experience like doing the uh, four step? I think you, you know, you had mentioned um, that you had a, you know, like an awakening around your dad and stuff. Yeah. Um, so what happened was I was doing it and of course you go in with all your ammo and still <laughs> very early in sobriety. And so yeah. you're thinking like, great, this is the part where I can talk about my resentments and my sponsor is yeah. going to be with me. And uh -huh. so, and I don't know that I exactly 
was fully convinced of that. But, you know, I thought I had this kind of chance to to talk about the bad things that people did to me. And I was like, eh, you know, we'll kind of touch on my part a little bit too, because that's in there apparently. <laughs> and um, little did I know it was uh, mostly about my part. Spoiler alert, if you haven't gone <laughs> through a fourth and fifth step, <laughs> you're about to do that. Um, it's all about you. And uh, yeah, and I didn't, didn't really see that coming. So I went in there and of course, one of the biggest things was my, uh, when my, was my dad, you know, amongst a lot of other things. Sure. This, Parents this is, are a big one. Yeah. And, and this is the one um, that kind of broke through. This was like the icebreaker was, um, uh, you know, said this and that about my dad and um, that he, you know, uh, you know, all the bad things in my, the, I had my category of perfect human being and perfect father and he didn't basically, Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't perfect. So I was was human. Yeah. yeah, He was a human being. So I was basically attacking him from every angle that I could. Mm -hmm. And so my sponsor just listened to me briefly and then stopped me. And he was like, okay, I understand that your father, you know, isn't perfect and that he did things that may or may not have been right. And probably that he shouldn't have. And I was like, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. And, uh, (laughs) and, and then he was like, okay. He said, well, what type of son were you to your father over this period of time? And I was like, <laughs> just <laughs> like, exploding like, brain. What? Exactly. Brain came out of my ears and I was like, oh my God. And I had never, and it sounds so silly today yeah. to frame it in this way, but I had never really sat and talked with somebody about my part in it. Yeah. I just like, and all the crazy stuff I had done all the hell that I put my parents through um, everything that they'd done to try and help me and advocate for me and love me. Um, And what I had done in return to all that, I was like, it finally set in and I just felt this like, Oh my God. And so I kind of felt that like shame and guilt. Uh It's kind of weird. You know, I kind of felt like, because all that sinks in, right. When you see, when you start realize, yeah. Yeah. You look through this different lens of like, Oh my God. Yeah. I had a lot to do with this. Maybe there's some things that you didn't have as much to do, but like, my God, through my using career, I put my parents through hell. Yeah. Um, I, like, so. I like to call that the awkward moment when you realize you're the asshole. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, ooh, like a, a complete paradigm shift. Is a complete that. shift. And thank God. Yes. It's amazing how these steps will just totally bust your illusions. Yes. And so that... And that sets you up, right, for yeah. making amends because you're like, wow, like I really realized now I did harm to this person, a lot of harm. And you gain empathy for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so what it is at the end of that, uh, step four and five was I figured out, wow, I'm really not perfect. And I've, I need to come to grips with that. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, well, my father is not perfect. And I need to come to grips with that, too. So yeah. at the end, it's not like um, you glaze everything over and like, oh, that never happened. Um, it's more so thinking like, okay, this person's a human being, they've screwed up. I'm a human being, I've screwed up. So let's forgive myself and let's forgive the other person. Yeah. Let's quit um slanting these weights of justice that I have in my own brain. Um, that like uh, the, the stuff that I do, it's okay because I know in my heart that I'm a good person. It's like, well, your actions don't really, you know, line up with that. So right. instead of slanting everything and you know, crucifying everybody else for you know, momentarily stepping out of line or maybe sneezing the wrong way or something like that. Yeah. I um, mean, cutting myself a break when I'm getting locked up and going to jail and all this stuff because I have a good heart. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny how that works. You know, the lens know, that we choose the, to look yeah. through. Yeah. It's just the self-denial and rationalization and justification and. Right. Uh, it's, you know, it's insanity. I really, I really feel like we need to do uh, a, a number two to this podcast because I feel like this whole time. You've been talking about, been how, talking about how terrible I was. Well, yeah. we can talk. We'll start. I'll give you a little airtime to talk about how awesome you are now. Yeah. I'm not saying that, but, but I'm no, doing listen, better. And in, in, all, in all fairness, um, I do want to talk about that because what I know of you, Jacob, is that you have completely, you have gone from this person who, um, you know, we've just described as, um, you know, sick, that's, you know, sick and not, 
and taking Very much so. you know, and doing bad things or whatever. But you have done what we all hope happens, right? Is that you have learned from this experience and turned your life around. And now you are not only a completely different person, but you are using your experience to help others. And, uh -huh. um, you've written this book and, you know, I don't, I don't mean to uh, steal your thunder here, but, um, you've written this book, which I think is going to help many people because it's so important for others to recognize, to see themselves in, in the story. Right. But to see, and even for parents, listen, there are so many parents who, um, are just so scared for their kids. Right. Yeah. And hopeless that it maybe it'll never work, but you, are an example of a walking miracle that you've, you've come out of this. And not only have you come out of it, but you have turned around and reached your hand back out to help others get out as well. So yeah. that is a miracle. It's, you know, t you know, you know, the op there's this uh, book called the obstacle is the way and your addiction was the obstacle, but it has, it has become the way that you have yes. been able to help others. So but let's talk about what you're doing with your life now because so you've written the book and you do some recovery coaching. Um, tell me what life is like now. Um, life is great. Life is, um, you know, is better than I could have ever imagined. We touched on earlier. I didn't, I didn't really know or have a category for what being sober was. I could never Im imagine myself being sober. Mm -hmm. Um, and being happy. I didn't have any, there is nothing that I could liken that to. And, um, so what I have now is, uh, what happens is you start to just walk and just give back in your recovery, mm -hmm. your sobriety. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me about what life is like now. So life is, um, it really is amazing now. Uh, it's just a blessing. I think it comes from a perspective of what I have been through and all mm -hmm. the tough times that I've been through. And so framed through that light of, of uh, going through those challenging times, life really is amazing right now. And it's a blessing. And I do my best to um, focus all of the, all my gratitudes in life and where God has brought me in. And it's a very humbling feeling because I know that it's only um, God that's brought me this far uh, because I try to rely on my own power and my own will and my own devices and uh, all my own stuff to, to try to attain this sobriety. Um, but what happens now is um, there's this verse that I love. Um, it's in Genesis 50 and 20. And it says, what you intended to harm me, God intended it for good for what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And I love that verse. It, it's something oh, that it's I've been living my life by because the same thing that almost took me out, the same thing that almost killed me, I've given it over to God and through the process of working these steps, through the process of committing myself to, um, to doing my very best to walk in God's will. And um, some days it's harder than others to do that. I'm not saying it's been a perfect journey. Sure. But I really, really do my best and strive for that. You know, I do my best to always uh, live in God's will. Um, and, uh, and the result has been amazing. He's, he's put me in places where I've gone on mission trips. Um, I remember having this calling um, when I was younger um, and God just telling me, you're, Jacob, you're supposed to go and impact and help millions of people. Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking like, I can't even get out of bed right now. I can't even take care of myself. I'm like a yeah. hopeless drug addict. I can't. What do you mean? And that I remember feeling the weight of that. And it was just crushing and killing me. Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew I had this longing. I always had this heart for people. Mm. But it was so covered up because of my addiction and the selfishness and just um, I was just way off course. Um, but I always yeah. had the, the heart was there. But there isn't any action uh, backing that up. And I'd know mm -hmm. how to do it. I had, right. I didn't know how to walk into this life where again, where I could even take care of myself and I'm supposed to go and help a lot of people, tons and tons of people. And I'm just like, mm. I don't even know what that looks like. Right. And, um, so I remember starting to walk in this path and starting to sponsor people and really feel like, um, walking in my God given design. Like I really and truly believe that as human beings, we're, we're, we're here to help each other yeah. because when you do that and you experience that, that is 
that that is continues to be a feeling that no drug or no alcohol, no nothing could ever touch. When you go and truly yeah. um, are of service to somebody that mm-hmm. is in need and are really able to help them out, that's that's an amazing, the cleanest, amazing, uh, and you just it, it's like um, stroking a golf ball, you know, just like right in the sweet spot or like hitting mm-hmm. the baseball, and it just feels right, you know. Yeah. Um, Unless you do it, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure everybody listening or that you've you've had the opportunity to help help people. So you know that feeling where you help yeah. people and just like wow, that like the indescribable. I can words fail me, but that feeling, you know, yeah. just feels so good. No, I totally get it. That I, I I sponsor women too, and there is nothing like it when and you know what it really is for me is like the presence of God and. Um, yeah you know, and I had to go, and I want to ask you about this too. Um, but I had that, I had to go through that process of throwing out everything that I thought I knew about God and just starting over, you know, and I had asked you earlier about a relationship with God. Did you feel like you found or developed this new relationship, um, through the 12 steps or how did that develop? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I like I said, I I grew up, you know, going to church and stuff like that, but I was very religious side of I was on the religious side of the fence where I was just going out of religious duty versus having right. a relationship. So uh, I wouldn't even consider myself at that point, like a follower of Jesus or anything like that. I'll just consider myself like, yeah, I'm going to heaven. I think I'm safe. Pretty sure at least, yeah. you know, like, you know, just kind of general stuff. But now I really do my best to develop a relationship with God yeah. and I'm really, really uh, all my categories that I thought I knew about God, from what other people told me. Um, maybe some of them are true, but maybe not, but I rediscovered them in a completely unique mm. way. It would yeah. be like, it would be like you telling me or just seeing about like Beyonce, like everybody knows Beyonce, right? Yeah. I hear about Beyonce all the time. But then like you go and meet Beyonce and it's like, Whoa, Whoa. Like, I didn't know Beyonce was like this. Like I would Beyonce love to meet Beyonce. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's it's amazing, and I think it's uh, all experience, yeah, having that personal yeah. experience, yeah. So, and then you can think of it like if this is how the experience for approaching or building a relationship with God is like if uh, if somebody's never tasted honey before, uh-huh. and um, you're trying to describe honey to somebody, and they're like, oh well, my parents they grew up and they just loved honey and they talked about it way too much, and then. So I have friends that, um, you know, they said they're allergic to honey and when they get around and they taste honey, it just makes them, you know, go crazy or swell up or whatever. And, you know, they have all these differing opinions. So he's like, I know, I know exactly what honey tastes like. And he's like, well, have you ever tasted honey? He's like, well, no, I've never actually tasted honey, but I know because I've, I've heard about, it. I know exactly what it is. And yeah. so the, the one time that the person actually, you know, walks up to this person and says, here's honey taste this and so the person says okay well i'll try it and i taste it and they're like oh my god yeah this is amazing this is this isn't what anything to describe this is like something i had to experience for myself right i feel like it's that way with god like a lot of people get this secondhand information through the eyes and through the filter of other people Mm, yeah that's what i would encourage people is to go seek out god on your own really develop a relationship with god um because what you hear from other people and this and that it may be true there may be parts of it that are true and parts of it may not be Mm -hmm. um but go find out for yourself that's where for me where i tap into my source of happiness and joy and uh you know servanthood yeah, yeah, and I've I've heard in the rooms that if um if you have a problem with God, chances are you have a problem with somebody else's God, right? Yeah, and that um and I just I love that about the twelve steps is that you have an opportunity to um decide for yourself what it is and have your own experiences. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and that can be really powerful. That's yeah. awesome. And um, so what is your um? We're coming up on our time and maybe you can share with me a little bit about, um, are you still going to meetings or like, so the name of the podcast is ODAT, which stands for one day at a time. So uh-huh. do you have a daily practice that helps you maintain your sobriety or a weekly practice? What does that look like? Yeah, so I do. Um, I still hit meetings weekly. Uh, and, uh, I have my one meeting that I still like to go to every week. Um, 
and uh, I'd like to go to everyone's every now and then and um, do different um, do different stuff that's recovery related. And I also have weekly stuff set up with my church. I lead the prayer ministry of my church and uh, serve there and then serve um, pretty much every Sunday at my church. And so I have things like that set up in recovery realms and in, mm-hmm. um, in, in church realms. But as far as daily practices go, I, um, what I, what I'd like to do is wake up and I like to listen to the first thing I open my eyes and I roll over and I don't check my phone. I do my best not to play around or do anything with my phone, mm-hmm. but I grab my phone and I just turn on music. Mm-hmm. I don't go to check my text messages. Don't check my emails. Um, so I just turn on like a praise and worship music and I listen to that for about, you know, I listen to one or two songs for about five or 10 minutes. And then I have a devotional in the morning that I read. And um, if you're wanting to do whoever's listening, something similar to this, um, you know, you have, you can have a 12 step devotional, you can have uh-huh. a scripturally based devotional, you can have whatever, an inspiring reading for the morning, whatever that looks like for you. Right. Um, and do that. And then what I do after that is pray. Um, yeah. So that's our step, you know, 10 and 11 uh-huh. and there is sought through prayer and meditation um, to improve our conscious contact with God. And, yeah. and so that's what I do is I'm always doing my best to improve my relationship with God through that. So doing those three things. And if you're listening, I would encourage you to, you know, to develop some type of morning process to where you intentionally set your day up to be uh-huh. spirit led, that you intentionally set yourself up to be fed early in the morning spiritually uh-huh. um, and that you set yourself up to be loving and tolerant and kind as possible when you go out through your right. day. No, that's a beautiful, I, I do that too. I mean, there's something very magical about setting your intention and how you start your morning that right. um, dictates the rest of your day. And I mean, like, I'm not perfect either. You know, there are days when I'm in a hurry or I wake up and I just, sure. you know, skip the whole morning thing. My day is very different. <laughs> yeah. the edges are a little harder. I'm a little less patient. I'm a little less tolerant. Things feel a little more shallow. Right. Definitely notice the difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. Cool. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that you have this amazing book called recovered how an un- unsustainable addiction, um, led to a sustained life. Uh, where can people find yeah. your book? Um, if you go on Amazon, you can find it on there. I think if you just type in recovered, um, that it's okay. the first one that pops up. So it was okay. great. I actually released it. And within hours, it went to number one in its category on Amazon. Congratulations. Is that is so, We probably should have mentioned that in the beginning, but that's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> we mentioned for 45 minutes in the beginning just how <laughs> terrible I was. You know, what, <laughs> you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a little intro and I'll talk about how awesome you are. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we need to like, like take we'll this it. section. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, uh, in the beginning a little bit somewhere yeah yeah so I'll, I'll, like I'll, but it, I'll do a nice intro for you yeah. yeah 20 minutes into it like this guy's terrible and yeah right. um, <laughs> hopefully it'll be like the, the the cherry on top i don't know it'll we'll be see. the cherry on top. yeah i'll, I'll do All a right. little bookend I'll, I'll start with a little intro and talk about how awesome you are and ask them to hold on <laughs> <laughs> please well, bear definitely. through me with the next 45 minutes yeah right yeah no we'll definitely i'll definitely leave, leave a link to your book uh, in the show notes on the website. And if people want to reach out to you, uh, where's the best place to find you? Sure. I have a website, um, called the sustained life, S U S T A I N E D life. And then also on Instagram, um, at sustained life. Uh, I like to do, put out some videos and inspiring, um, content on there. So those are two places that you can find, follow, or reach out to me. That's awesome. Yeah. I I remember seeing some of your videos on Instagram and they're just really nice, concise, bite size, um, practical, um, suggestions that you can like apply right away. I love that stuff. So thank you. Good job on those. I really like them. Thanks so much. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining me today and doing round two. Um, (laughs) I encourage people to uh, check out your website and reach out and say hi, but thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. All right. Thank you, Arlene. I had a great time. All right. Talk soon. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. 
One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.